one. Hey everyone, Daniel here. In this episode of Director Discussions, the man, the myth, the legend, I am immensely honoured to sit down. One of my favourite filmmakers, one of my directing heroes, the amazing Chris McQuarrie. If you're watching this, you're thinking, how did that little Irish bollocks pull this off? And the answer to that is that I'm just so elusive. But no, Chris, I cannot thank you enough. For anyone who doesn't know, I mean, where do I begin? He's the Oscar winning, the amazing. Uh, he's the director behind, you know, I'm sure this little known action franchise called Mission Impossible. I'm sure you might have heard of it. Uh, he's directed two installments of that, the most recent ones with Rogue Nation and Fallout. He's directing the next ones, uh, Dead Reckoning Part 1 and Dead Reckoning Part 2. Besides MI, he is the director behind Jack Reacher and The Way of the Gun. And he has screenwriting credits on films such as The Usual Suspects, Top Gun Maverick, and much, much more. I got just about caught my breath there. But Chris, thank you so much for coming on, sir. How are you doing today? My pleasure. Uh, I, I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I just committed that introduction to memory. I didn't use a page or anything. These things just come off the top of my head. I don't really know how I do it. I think I'm, I'm an actor that way. I can just memorize these monologues. I don't need a sheet or anything like that to help me. But listen, I manage. So, I mean, first okay. things first. Let's just jump right into it. I mean, you know, we've been trying to put this chat together for a while and I'm so grateful we chat. But recently, I'm sure everyone has heard of this big thing called CinemaCon. It's this huge event, you know, hosted yearly, I believe, where they talk about the newest films and stuff like that. And then there was this one video from uh, this little known Hollywood actor, Tom Cruise. And he's, you know, he's, he's driving a plane and he's, a, he's on top of a plane. He's talking about the new Mission Impossible. I'm sure you've all have seen the trailer and I'm sure you've all have seen that clip. And then... Christopher McQuarrie rolls up next to him in a yellow plane. I'm like, what the hell? Where did Christopher McQuarrie come from? And he tells him, you know, we have to start shooting. You should all go check out the video. But that's when I kind of realized, okay, I'm never going to interview this guy. He's gone around the plains in South Africa. <laughs> yeah, he's just, he's a, he's just, he's levels above me. So, uh, yeah, my first question, you can fly a plane? Uh, I, I have flown planes. I, I am not qualified to fly that plane. I am... Uh... There's somebody in the front seat flying that plane. It's a very, uh, a, a, an amazing pilot named Lee Proudfoot. In fact, um, the uh, that video in question, uh, there were a lot of very talented people involved. Um, uh, the pilot of my plane was Lee Proudfoot. The pilot yeah. of Tom's plane was, uh, was a pilot named John Romain. Two very brilliant, uh, extremely, extremely experienced, extre some of the best pilots in the world. Uh, and in the helicopter that was flying next to us, that was being flown by a, an amazing pilot named Will Banks. Uh, and the camera operator was a guy named Phil Arntz, who's an absolute artist. And Eddie Hamilton, our editor, was flying in the helicopter and he was he was uh, he was directing the frame on that. So, I mean, you have a few achievements, you know, directing a big blockbuster franchise, you know, being in a plane in South Africa, being on my channel. I'd kind of just winning an Oscar. They're all one and the same. It's, I kind of believe. Like, I'm just going to, this is it. This is the peak. And I'm just going to. I didn't want to say it because I can't, but now that you've admitted it yet, this is your peak, you know. I no, mean, it is time. It is time to write my memoir. I'm just yeah, tired. exactly. And yeah, I get a whole chapter dedicated to me. You can dedicate it to me. I don't mind. I'm good like that. My people can talk to your people about payment and stuff like that. You know, we, yes. we'll get, we'll get that, all that on the books. But no, I mean, Chris, let's just jump right into it. What is the Macquarie origin story? Were you a fan of film growing up? Uh, I was. I was actually, um, I was a model, terrible student. Uh, so you really take after me. It's good to know I can make it in the business. You're going to be just fine. Let me tell you right now. That's, that's the, the first, uh, to me, I consider that to be an essential qualification to making it in film. With everybody I've had any kind of real success with, they're all people who were essentially terrible in school or in one way or another, uh, social misfits, not outcasts, but misfits. And I certainly had a, a phase of mine growing up where I felt very much like an outcast, always felt like a misfit and still, still really do. Yeah. Um, but yes, I was a terrible, terrible student and loved movies, loved reading, loved writing. Yeah. Uh, uh, had no ambitions to work in film. My, my first love was writing. Uh, and when I was in sixth grade, uh, I was 12 years old. I was writing a short story in class uh, rather than doing my work, which was which was typical. And we had a substitute teacher that day named Mrs. Huber. I will never forget. She asked me what I was doing. I told her I was writing a story. And she said, is that what you want to do uh, with your life? And I had not thought of it up until that point. In fact, I don't have a conscious memory of the first thing I wrote, I was just always telling and creating stories. 
And when she said that, when she asked me that question, it flipped a switch in my head, uh, which I can I can very vividly recall and thinking to myself, yes, that, oh my God, that actually is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And from that moment on, school uh, was just a, school was, a, was, was basically, a, I was serving a prison sentence and just waiting to get out of school. I, I didn't, um, I, I, I felt the, the institution no longer had anything to offer me. Uh, and, and, and so you jumped right into Mission Impossible out of high school. You know, you just got, you got I left right into it. Yes, that was uh, no. And then, um, and I really didn't, uh, I, I, and I loved movies. I loved watching movies and I watched them quite obsessively. I had a friend growing up with whom I watched movies all the time. And we would, every week, we would take out the New York Times. Uh, this was in New Jersey where I was growing up. We'd take out the New York Times and we'd look at the big full page ads for the movies that were coming up the following yeah. weekend. And we would do a little bit of a Tetris where we would figure out how to go how to go from one movie to another and fit the most movies into a weekend that we could until I was finally forbidden by my mother from doing that. It was, uh, not only was it was it uh, not only was I spending a lot of money, but again, I wasn't doing homework on the weekends. And uh, so I got a slap on the wrist and then I, then I would have to sneak out and go see movies. Uh, and when I graduated high school, I lived abroad for a year, um, kind of trying to figure out what, what the next step was going to be. And I went to work uh, for a detective agency in New Jersey that was, um, uh, my my father's cousin uh, ran a detective agency. He was a former police chief. And I thought it was going to be private investigating. I thought it would be really cool. Um, and really, a lot of it was uniform security work. And yeah. one of the jobs was being a security guard at a movie theater uh, in a pretty rough part of New Jersey. And in fact, when you watch the opening credits of The Sopranos, yeah. that, was my, that was my commute to work. I used to drive by those big drive safely fuel tanks every day on the turnpike. Um, And that was supposed to be a summer job and it lasted four years. And what I didn't realize then, I only realized years later, that was my film school. I was standing in a movie theater for four years with the world's greatest focus group. Um, You know, and I was, I was watching, I was paid to watch the audience watching movies. Um, Because the where we where I was working it was pretty rough and fights used to break out. It was a, you know, we were we were essentially there to to, to keep some semblance of peace, and uh, and so a lot of my time was spent watching movies I probably never would have otherwise gone to see and yeah. and listening to and 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 through osmosis taking in the audience's reaction and I developed over the course of that time a very acute. Uh, sense of empathy for yeah. the audience yeah. yeah totally and so I mean you know I mean screenwriting but that was always kind of the goal did directing ever even occur to you because you look at you know where you are now did you ever want to be a director or was it always that screenwriting that just appealed to you uh really I wanted to write books and I really didn't think about yeah. writing screenplays and then once I did start writing and making movies um and I'm a I, as I said I'm a terrible student a slow learner uh I learned from mistakes. I don't really learn from reading about things or studying things. Um, I, uh, uh, I I had a story I really wanted to tell and wanted to tell so specifically yeah. that I knew if, if, I, if I wanted to tell the story, I had to tell it myself. Uh, but it was a giant historical epic. And to get there, I knew I had to, I knew I had to start with a smaller film. And that's when I made my, that's when I directed my first movie off of the success of Usual Suspects, yeah, uh, and that was the way the gun, which was something of a something of a disaster, yeah. And I didn't direct again for twelve years. I couldn't. I really couldn't get a movie made. I couldn't get arrested. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it wasn't until um, I wrote uh, in that time. In that time when I was not really able to get anything made, I was working as a script doctor at studios and I was 
Um, and I was developing a lot of bad habits. And any of your writers out there, any, anybody listening to this who's, an, who's a screenwriter, and I do not say aspiring screenwriter yeah. or aspiring director, uh, I hate that word, take it out of your title. Um, when, uh, when I was working at the studio, I realized over the course of that 10 years or so, again, only in retrospect, yeah. I never learned a single useful thing about filmmaking from any of the people for whom yeah. I was writing screenplays and, and constantly in an effort to, to gain their approval and get past them as gatekeepers to the people who are actually making movies. I was working in service of something that was in no way, shape or form about making movies. You're most of the time when you're writing for producers and executives of a certain level. Yeah. You're actually servicing their career and not servicing your own, and um, and and you're good as long as you are of use to them. And the minute that you're not of use to them, everything that they have failed to deliver is your fault. And uh, and so I lived that way for a very long time. While I was, that's how I was making my living. And and in that time, I was also developing screenplays that I wanted to do. So I, I, I call that period my, my wilderness years. And, and, and in those wilderness years, I was writing movies that could I was rewriting movies yeah. that could never get made to finance the writing of movies that no one would make. And in that pile of scripts, which still exists and sits in a drawer, uh, the only movie to get made was Valkyrie. Um, really? Yeah. And Valkyrie was, was, one of two World War II movies that Nathan and I, Nathan Alexander and I developed at the same time. Um, I, I actually think it's the lesser of the two movies. The other one is, is I think, a much better film. Uh, and it's a film I would make, I would write and make very differently now compared to what I did then. Um, and, uh, and Valkyrie led to my collaboration with Tom Cruise, which has been, uh, which has been going on for, 15 years now yeah totally and i mean you know we've talked about there you know usual suspects you won an oscar i mean you know for what your second your second feature film that's not half bad but when you won that oscar what was that was that feeling coming from afterwards and going into some like way to go did you feel like okay well now i can do anything or was there a pressure there because it's like you've just won an oscar your next project like how do you how do you even follow something like that was there a pressure or was it was it just like automatically a good thing what was your mindset then um, you know, I, because I, that, because of the kind of student and learner I am, um, a lot of things that would probably hit people instantly take years to hit me. Um, yeah. which is probably fortunate in the case of an Academy Award because I don't, I, I, I never felt I had to now be that person. I, ne I didn't have to live up to that. I, yeah. um, I have. I have very complex feelings when it comes to uh, the notion of who your audience is and why you're making movies. I don't make movies for the few thousand members of the academy. If you're if you're if you're if you're chasing after an academy award, you're doing uh, it for the wrong reasons. Yeah, you're you're doing it for the wrong reasons, and you're doing it for well. Look, right around, look. If, if that's your definition of success, great. If your definition of success is awards, if it's critics. Uh, if it's giant box office, if it's any one of those things, those are, to me, th that's not how you define success. Those are, those are measures of a film's resonance, whether it resonates with the Academy, it resonates with critics, or it resonates with an audience. And success and failure are very interchangeable things. And something that feels like a failure now could turn out to be a success later. And something that feels like a, a success now could actually uh, could actually be a failure later. Um, so I never fell into that trap. What I did was I, I fell into a much worse trap, which was a, which was a financial one. I, yeah. um, I, uh, you know, there, I was making very good money writing, rewriting movies and, uh, and was, and, and was living a very good life but I was trapped in it. I did, I suddenly had a life I, that I needed to maintain. I had a house I had to pay for. I had a family. Um, yeah. Things that I didn't have as an independent filmmaker, I suddenly had. 
Sure. And I had not prepared for those things. So my focus was split. Um, I have other friends. I have another friend, Steve Chabosky, who's, uh, he wrote Perks of Being a Wallflower. And he, many years later, directed the movie based on his own book. Steve was was very smart. Steve was very frugal, uh, you know, saved his money, lived modestly, and and built his career into a place where he didn't have to compromise and didn't have to spend years working okay. for people who are not actually developing your talent. They're sucking it out of you. Um, I look at a guy like Ryan Johnson and how Ryan made uh, he made brick. And, uh, and interestingly enough, I remember I was uh, at the beginning of Ryan's career when brick was out, I was on the nominating committee for the spirit awards. So really? I was there. Yeah. I was there as one of the people considering his movie for the, for this award. And I, and so I've, I've now gotten to know Ryan and I've watched his career go from Brick to the Brothers Bloom to Looper to Star Wars, which to me is a pretty amazing. Not half bad, not, not, not a bad trajectory. Uh, that's, that's a pretty impressive game in four moves. Um, mine is not, you, you, you could look at mine from orbit and say the way the gun, Jack Reacher, uh, uh, Mission Impossible, there was, there were many, many, many years. Yeah. Uh, in between that and really where my um, where my directing developed was not directing the way of the gun uh, way of the gun I did everything every writer does when they get a chance to direct a movie they decide they're going to protect the screenplay they've they've really? seen all the, they've, they've they're frustrated and watching directors get all the glory and watching directors change all the best stuff about their scripts yeah, I did the same thing. I protected the screenplay. I trusted dialogue. Um, I I believed, you know, I believed that 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 the whole audience, rather than a specific audience, wanted to be challenged and antagonized. Uh, and then I was shocked when I made a movie that that was meant to frustrate the audience, and they were not only frustrated by the film, they hated it, and 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 and, and there were people who hated me personally for yeah. making it. People get very passionate about it. Um, so when I was then working on Valkyrie, where now I was a producer, um, quite unexpectedly a producer on that film, I was very heavily involved in all of these aspects of filmmaking without having the burden of being the director while making the movie. Yeah. And, and by producing and by working with, uh, other, other filmmakers, other creators, I was working with Tom and I was... I was I was watching this movie come together in a very different way and being challenged in by Tom to produce the movie something I didn't know how to do. Um, my sure. my whole strategy was uh, with Valkyrie was to sell the script, take a producing credit, pay off my debts, and quit the movie business. I was going to go back to writing. I was just tired of of being in development hell for so long. Yeah, and uh, Tom insisted. I only found this out much later after our first meeting. He said, I'll, I'm going to make this movie, but I'll only make it if if he's producing it. I didn't know that. So every day I went to work thinking sooner or later, Tom Cruise is going to realize I don't know what I'm doing and I'm going to get fired off this movie. And I've maintained that attitude ever since. I don't take it <laughs> for granted. I don't, I don't go to work thinking, I've worked with Tom Cruise for 15 years. You know, I go to work every day saying, I have this privilege. I... Yeah. I have this partnership. Uh, I am going to treat this as, um, you know, this is not a given. Uh, I have to work every day to earn my right to be here. I see a lot of filmmakers, uh, they, they get to a place where they feel they have uh, power. They feel they have carte blanche. Uh, I see it happen to actors as well. They get to a place where they reach such a, such a place of success that they think, well, now, now I can get, I can do it my way. I don't have to do the things I don't like. I sure. get to do the things I want to do. And the truth of the matter is, um, you that's that's where I see people lose it. Is they you there is no easy way to make movies. There is no there are no good movies that that come from a bullshit free, yeah. uh, stress free environment. You can manage that stress, but you're, you you still have to you still have to deal with it. You still have it's to get a it. job. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you you you're you're Rocky. I mean, you're literally Rocky. You know, to not make a film for twelve years and now be at the head of I mean one of the biggest franchises in the world, I think is really amazing. But you think that was it twelve years of not directing any films? Twelve years, yeah. Twelve, 12 years. Twelve years. Do you think that made you the director you are today, uh, for the better or for the worse? Or do you feel like did you need that experience at all? I mean, I'm sure you could have lived without it, but look, if I had made the film I wanted to make when I was what, twenty, twenty-seven, twenty-eight years old. Uh, I'd have been crushed. I'd have made a, I'd, I'd, I did not know. Look, I don't believe I really knew what I was doing um, Yeah. Uh, as a director. Like, where did I really feel like a director? Where did I really feel like, oh, I understand this craft and what it's about and what am I doing? Uh, it, it, was if, it was when I directed the opening scene of the movie I'm directing now, which was one of the last scenes I shot. Really? Um, yeah i look every movie for me is a learning experience every movie for me is a is is an is an opportunity to grow and to look yeah. back on what i did and say how could i have done that better um and never to believe that i know that that i it, when i directed my first film i gave i came into it with an attitude like i'll show them you know yeah. now now i'm going to do it my way uh, exactly like those other people I was talking about. Only I did it with none of the experience and none of the, I, my second screenplay won an Academy Award. I must know what I'm doing. Um, the truth of the matter is that The Usual Suspects works as a kind of movie and it and it delivers on a on a very simple premise. It's a magic trick. It's everything in that movie builds towards a very specific conclusion and it it sticks the landing yeah, because yeah. everyone was committed to sticking that landing. That's not Top Gun Maverick. That's the usual suspects. It and and what happens is you you run the risk when you make a movie like the usual suspects of thinking, well, now every movie's got to be the usual suspects. Well, yeah, and people ask me all the time, why don't you write a sequel to that movie? Why don't you make another movie like that movie? Yeah. Well, twists are hard to come by twists you you haven't seen before and and you have to build the whole movie around that now i learned a lot of lessons from that which i've applied to mission impossible the the biggest being i do not fool you you fool yourself and anytime you get anytime you you get taken for a ride by a mission impossible movie anytime you get surprised those are all lessons i learned from the usual yeah. suspects um, and that stuff's that stuff's easy. Making people cry is hard. Making people like unlikable characters is hard. Making people yeah. making people forget their own existence for two hours and fifteen minutes in an uninterrupted stream of semi consciousness. Yeah, that's hard. That's very hard and very very specific. Yeah. That's my pursuit. That's what I'm after. I'm I'm after your engagement i want you to sit down start watching the movie and not have to think about it to enjoy it now i want to be very clear i i, I was always annoyed by the the description of oh i want people to come and shut their brain off for two hours that's not yeah. it that's not it i i don't want you to shut your brain off and i don't want you to not think about the movie after you left what i want you to do is i want you to enter a, a another conscious reality other than your own and I want you to ex and I want you to experience that reality uninterrupted for two hours and however many minutes. Um, and and that and when it's over, you had no sense of how long you were gone. That to me is the dream. It's not awards, it's not money, it's not yeah. critics, it's not it's not a reputation. I don't care if you think of me as a journeyman or an auteur or a visionary or a hack or a shooter um yeah. i i don't i don't have a title to live up to i don't care if one movie is an academy movie and the other movie is an action film none of that matters to me what matters to me is i've been given a job to deliver yeah. this this franchise this title this story this experience um sit down and watch it and you're going to and you're going to be transported yeah, I don't, want to waste, I don't want to waste your time. That's really the 
and I and I think you do an excellent job of that. I mean, yeah, that's that's yeah. such a fascinating way. I mean, to look at film because obviously so much goes into it. And I mean, yeah, it should just be for passion and for love. But obviously, I mean, yeah, you just put it perfectly there. But now let's jump into it. Mission Impossible. We've got the Macquarie origin story. I mean, are you in London right now? Are you cutting Mission Impossible? Are you still shooting it or? I am. I am. I am editing the movie. Uh shooting the movie and shooting mission impossible eight we're we're in a kind of a we're in a nether world between the two movies right now they're because of um normally we would have just shot these things back to back um but because of things like an actor's availability the time it takes to build a specific set on a specific stage the weather in a certain part of the world the movies are kind of now mixed together so yeah. we're we, it, it, there there are there are days uh where i'm actually shooting both movies you know i'll be shooting seven in the morning and eight in the afternoon really? um, yeah only because of a very complicated logistical puzzle of yeah uh, making our release dates and contending with the fact that this movie was started during the pandemic and and how and how the how complicated the pandemic made everything so i didn't see a rough assembly of this movie until um let's put it this way i could have made fallout uh and start and and shot another movie before i foresaw the the rough assembly of of mission seven which is a weird experience because you're making something for so so long and and you never have the moment to step back and say here's what i did um and we, Eddie, Eddie Hamilton and I had assembled chunks of the movie during a little hiatus that we had, and so I knew I knew I had a, a, a third act. I knew I had, um, and I knew I had some pretty some pretty gorgeous stuff. Yeah. The context wasn't there, and that's that's really that's really what matters to Mission Impossible. The, the action is kind of what we owe you. It's yeah. the why do I the, the why do I give a shit part is the is the is the tricky part of that movie is how do I invest the characters in it? How do I invest the audience in a character's journey? Yeah, like, why should it, I care when you're going in? Yeah. Correct. And it, so you have to you have to put the whole movie together and then and you and the movie leaves you wanting certain things. It surprises you in other places. So I watched the assembly and a scene much like with Rogue Nation, a scene that was a simple dialogue scene. Um, it turned out to be deeply emotional and turned out to be my really? favorite scene in the movie, my favorite scene in the entire movie. And, uh, and, and, and really surprised us all. And when I, and when I brought it to Tom and I didn't say anything about it, we just sat down and watched the movie. The, we got to that scene and that scene really, it really hit him as well. And that's when I knew it was working. And that's that's kind of what Tom and I are are about. We're sort of a sounding board for yeah. one another. We're, we have a we have a pretty uh, a pretty uh, consistent and pretty honest view of our own work. And part of that honesty is understanding that it's very easy to delude yourself. So that yeah. even when you're even when you're loving something, uh, you don't don't convince yourself that it's it's great you're you 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 you, you've got to look at it objectively you have to look at it in context and you have to to look at it with an audience yeah and so i mean what can you tell us about the plot synopsis for dead reckoning one follow up by dead reckoning two can you show us the script just so we can i mean i think this i'll just get the exclusive you can just tell us how the film begins start up some up back up just get get the whole film out of the way I can tell you, uh, I can tell you it, it, that that everything that you see in the trailer uh, is is so far still in the movie, except for one shot. Really? Um, yeah, there's one shot in the trailer that uh, is now in eight and not. It's in part two and not part one. It was. I was convinced it would be in in. Uh, I was originally convinced it would be in part one. And then when I watched the whole movie, I realized, oh my God, wait a minute. This is actually, um, this, this actually doesn't need to be here in this movie. It's incredibly important in the next movie. Man. So rather than asking the audience to remember it now, I'm going to, I'm going to punt it later. Uh, so if you go and watch that trailer, it's a pretty good indication of, um, at least it's, it's still a pretty good indication of the, of the movie we're making. 
Oh, amazing. I love that trailer. Here's my McHugh story. I went to the cinema to see Top Gun Maverick. And the trailer before that was, I think, I, I, I believe this right, but it was Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning. It was the first trailer. And I was sitting there thinking, and I leaned over to my sister and I go, you see that guy, McCoy? I'm going to be interviewing him. And she just told me to shut up. She didn't really care. But I was like, listen, I care. So that's all that really matters. Um, but yeah, so let me let me ask you this. You know, I mean, you look at the directors behind Mission Impossible. Starts with the Palmer. I believe the second is Wu. I, I, this is just yeah. off memory. The uh, Palmer, Wu, Abrams. Was it Bird who came on? After mm-hmm. Abrams and then you and then you, you were the only director in the franchise to end up doing two films and now the rest of them. I mean, what's it like to look at a franchise where each film is so stylistically different, where, you know, one film has that J.J. Abrams sass to it. Another one has that, you know, Brad Bird kind of animation style he brings to it. And then to come on to something like that, is that daunting to you at all as a filmmaker? Because you are the only filmmaker to do more than one Mission Impossible. You know, Fallout was daunting um, because, you know, First of all, Rogue Nation following that murderer's row of directors was pretty intimidating. And I had only yeah. I'd only really directed two films. Um and uh, uh and and that was that was a big and, and daunting task. Um I uh sorry, thanks. Um I was uh my my bag has just been delivered to me, which I left behind today. Um <laughs> My, uh, yeah, that was very, so, so following a, a, just delivering that movie was a huge relief yeah. and then being, and then being asked to do another one and, and feeling like I can't possibly follow that movie. I put everything that I had into that movie. Um, and then, so then with fallout, it was, um, I, 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 I guess I didn't expect I, I didn't I didn't expect Fallout to work. I did know I I mean when I say work, I didn't I I didn't expect Fallout to to do as well as it did. And then um and so all I set out to do on that movie was look, I'm not gonna try to top myself, I just want to make a movie that lives up to these other movies. Yeah. Want, it belongs in the in the franchise because I'm just never gonna never gonna make a movie that's you're 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 not going to get away with it um and what i did learn on fallout the the thing that i made the agreement i had with tom was i would do another one but i had to i had to be a different filmmaker i had to maintain that feeling that a different filmmaker was that 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 what the what the the franchise that the expectation had come to create was something of a of some, something stylistically di- different in every film. I have since learned that um, that's not that's not something I am in control of anymore. That just happens. I simply because I'm not interested in maintaining a style or a or a brand. Um, I've never worked to develop one. I've never promoted myself in that way. I find that to be a trap. I find it to be kind of, um, I find it to be exhaust. It's the same thing we we're talking about. Like if you're appealing to the academy, yeah. Um, I don't really care that you know I directed the movie. I care that you are immersed in the movie, and and as such, the camera is. Uh, I have very little control over where the camera goes once I've determined certain yeah. aspects of a scene settings things like that, that, that the shots become, they are dictated to me by the needs of story. Um, the only thing, uh, the, the, and, and what influences that work is my collaborators. I have a camera operator on this film uh, named Jonathan Richmond, uh, Chunky Richmond, he's known as. And um, uh, he, he's somebody with whom I have a very, uh, a very close uh collaborative relationship in terms of the frame and I had a very specific developed sense of how I like to cover scenes yeah and Chunky came on on the first day and blew all that up he introduced me to a new lens and showed me the verse and it was a lens I had kind of been taught by a previous collaborator to avoid using Chunky said "No, no 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 use this lens and watch what we can do with it and I also came to the movie saying to Fraser Taggart, her cinematographer, 
Um, I don't want to use a dolly. Uh, I don't want to use, uh, I, I, I never want to use a dolly in the film. I want to use a uh, Steadicam crane and I don't want to shoot standard coverage. I want to avoid standard coverage whenever I can. Uh, I want the camera to feel alive. I want the movie to feel light. I, I was, I, I had grown very frustrated by coverage. So yeah. when you're watching, this is me giving you the secret sauce. When you're watching, uh, I would say the big change from Rogue Nation to Fallout was uh, a very different cinematographer between Robert Ellswood and Rob Hardy, uh, a very different composer from Joe Kramer to Lauren Balfe, but also my understanding of uh, my comfort in starting to meddle in the other people's departments. I, I Early on, I believe, you hired a cinematographer, you hired a production designer, you hired a costume designer, you let them do your their thing. Yeah. I then started to understand, actually, no, I have to I have to push all those departments in different directions and uh and 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 I felt now qualified to do it. So then by the time we got to from the, the change from Fallout to Dead Reckoning, um there were I was able to look at Fallout and say, well here are all the things that slowed the movie down. Here were the things that frustrated me in editorial. And rather than getting rid of those things, which is what people tend to do, yes. say, I don't like I don't like doing that, so I'm going to eliminate it. Well, if you don't, don't put something in its place, you just you've eliminated a trope, but you haven't you haven't yes. fixed your movie. Um and so I committed to something which on the one hand eliminated coverage. I didn't have to shoot lots and lots of setups for every scene. Really? setups became infinitely more complicated and took longer to shoot so yeah. I mean, it's all kind of and then at a certain point i realized i'm i'm in it now this is this is how this movie is being made on the movie that i will do after um and after dead reckoning one and two the the next movie we're talking about doing i would go uh, i would go completely back to the egg i'd go back to where uh, in a lot of ways where I started in terms of um, into limiting myself in terms of equipment and, 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 and style and, yeah. and try to try to step back more from the movie. Um, so I don't, I don't know that you'll ever see a specific style develop unless, unless I told the same story twice. Yeah. Totally, and I feel like you've you've really managed that. I mean, between Rogue Nation and you know, they they both really do feel like different films, and I think that's what's really amazing when one filmmaker can make two films that stylistically obviously do feel different. But that's amazing. Another thing about Mission Impossible, that I think we've all kind of known for, is its stunts, its it's huge action sequences. How hard is it for you, especially as a screenwriter, to balance that kind of dichotomy between character building and stuff, then also having you know a, a motorbike chase sequence throughout you know streets? You know, how hard is it to know? how to kind of balance them and, you know, also writing action sequences. Do you think action sequences are such a huge fundamental part of Mission Impossible? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, to us, action is character. Um, that the, that, that we're, we're developing character while the action is happening. Your, your, what we're creating in those sequences are, are opportunities for behavior that, portray character and you'll notice in Mission Impossible we don't really mix plot with action we don't we don't have people learning about the important stakes of the movie while the action is happening we set it up so you know what it is we show you often what's supposed to happen so that you're 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 looking forward to a third act and saying well this is all going to go wrong how's it going to go wrong and then when it goes wrong no one is explaining to you everything is going wrong you get to just feel it yeah and, and what tom is excellent at doing with ethan hunt uh with with bill cage in edge of tomorrow with jerry Maguire, um with just about everybody every character he's ever played with the exception of probably vincent and collateral yeah he's 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 not afraid of showing you his vulnerability, of introducing his character's vulnerability. Ethan Hunt doesn't want to do the things he does. He's not, he's not an action hero who's just doing those things and not thinking about it. Yeah. He would prefer, he would prefer to do it any other way. He is compelled by a uh by a sense of obligation. And uh, and and so the um 
the uh, uh, the, the the character and the stuff that you're talking about is all, all coming to you through yeah. his behavior during during that action. And then, of course, there's the team dynamic, which is kind of Mission's version of the family. Um, and and we're always trying to infuse that with humor while understanding that Mission Impossibles are globe-trotting uh, melodramatic spy movies. So in order for there to be stakes, there have to be tragedy, there have to be real villains, there has to be real danger. But then you also have to bring the audience back from yeah. that. It's a real challenge to have a character like, spoiler alert, have uh, Alec Baldwin die in... Um, in fallout and spend the does. time sorry <laughs> spend the appropriate amount of time mourning that character's loss but then get the audience laughing again and remind them that they're in a mission impossible and not let that tone yeah take over the movie um and and so that's that's really what what tom and i do not just in mission but in, in its most heightened form probably is in is in mission yeah, and something that you've talked about, you know, in your interview, and this is something that's really fascinating. You said there's three components to making a good mission. It's clarity, geography, and spectacle. Do you, do you stand by that? Uh, did, I say, I, did I say spectacle? Clarity and geography, absolutely. I think character, geography, and character. Spectacle for me um, is, spectacle is kind of what you'll get with, yeah. you know, with the, with the action that you committed to getting. Um, spectacle is what you'll get because Tom Cruise is committed to doing things that other actors probably wouldn't. And it makes my job simultaneously easier and harder. You know, normally what you're doing in my position is you're hiding the fact that it's not the actor. In Mission Impossible, you have to find ways to show that it is the actor. It creates rules for how the movie is shot it's not say tom has rules it's this this the the situation creates rules where okay i've got to i've got to be attached to this character and you will be attached to tom's character in places yeah in in dead reckoning and in and in in part one and part two you'll you'll be attached to tom's character in in ways you you cannot fathom like it's it's the, the challenge of getting the camera in a place where it was with Tom, yeah, is it was was extreme. It required real engineering and real ingenuity on the part of a lot of people. When you do that, spectacle kind of naturally follows. So I don't I don't yeah. worry about who this will be spectacular. I look at a sequence and say, how can I push this character to his absolute limit beyond yeah. the limits I've seen him do before. And also, I look at other movies and say, God, I really admire the way they did that sequence. I'd like to do my version of that. And I get dinged a lot for this This, this gag was an X movie or that. I don't care. If, if somebody did something before that they don't own it, and it's like, it's, it, it's, not, it's not me copying another filmmaker. There's a lot of times I'm not even aware of a... Of a of some gag that existed in another movie. If you walked up to me in the middle of my shooting and they said, hey, they did this in a in this Korean film. And I was like, okay, it works in our movie. I'm, I'm gonna yeah. do it. And and this is my cover of that standard. Um, I don't limit myself in thinking that, the, look, the truth of the matter is there's just, there's no such thing as an original idea. Yeah. And, and there's really no such thing as unoriginal execution because, even if you tried to copy somebody perfectly, yeah, it's going to be yours and not theirs. It's going to have your DNA in it. It's going to be in a different location, and the time of day is going to be different, and a million other things are. are so I don't really, I don't really concern myself with, you know, have I seen? I, and frankly, I don't have the energy. The other amazing thing is when somebody says, "Oh, you stole this shot from such and such." I can't do that for the simple fact that I'm actually not in control the sheer effort it takes to put something specific in a movie of this yes. size where you really want to say, Oh, I've always wanted to do this shot. You're going to get crushed every time. The <laughs> movie is just, the, the train is moving 
and you're just you're just laying down track in front of it. Yeah. And you're not really stopping to think of, gee, now was this in, you know, has any other director done this? Has any other film done that? It's like, no, I gotta, I could I gotta get him from I gotta get him on the side of the plane. The plane's gotta take off and I've got to care why the character's doing it. I just don't care. I just don't care. I'm more I'm more interested and I and I don't think the average viewer does. I think the average yeah, viewer I think you're right. Thing is saying, give it to me, give me what I paid for, give me what I want. Yeah, no, you put it perfectly there. Uh, but someone I'd love to ask you about. I mean, I saw this, I forget which I might mean, might have been deadline or something like this, but they said you and Tom are doing three new projects. So I mean I wonder could we get some clarification? Uh Les Grossman, is that a character you want to do something with soon? I'm um I'm uh I'm not saying anything. <laughs> This, this is how I get my art. All, all I could, all I could tell you is that the, the 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 least true thing that that article said is that there were three things we're talking about. Tom and I have never been talking about less than three things, um, <laughs> and 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 very and, and very very serious about them. Um, and we. We have Tom is always working on three movies. It's the movie he just shot, the movie he's shooting, yeah. and the movie he's getting ready to make. It at the at the moment we are actually working on two movies simultaneously. For a time, we were working on three. We were in post on Top Gun Maverick. We were in yeah. we were in production on uh, on part one, and we were in prep on part two. Yeah. Um, so. I would, but but I will say, having now with Tom and I having come through Top Gun and two Mission Impossibles, we sat down and said, you know, okay, let's what what are your ambitions? What are the kind of movies that you've always wanted to make? What are the um, what are the muscles you want to exercise? We came away from Top Gun and from the and from the rough cut of Part One, yeah feeling feeling ready to uh to take everything we learned and apply it to other to other things to attack other stuff other than mission impossible um because really honestly top gun um is is the culmination of everything we've learned working yeah. together um and and the and the level of work that went into that movie the the refusal to accept anything as, as good enough and the constant honing and polishing until every single instant of that movie was as emotionally engaging as it could be. I read one review that that was that was quite positive about the film, but then it said it said even though it feels every moment is is engineered for its for its emotional impact. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's actually. <laughs> that's actually the point that's actually what you pay for what are you talking about yes every single moment we sit down and watch every moment and say am i feeling it am i invested yes. am, I am i confused in it and and am i confused in a way it, look you can be confused in a movie so long as the protagonist is confused so long as somebody's in the story telling you you should be confused now if you just get confused you get bored and you disconnect from the narrative and then i got to spend all this energy getting you back into it yeah. So so that's what we do. We we've, we've learned to engineer movies for their maximum emotional effect uh and developed a language a, a shorthand a vocabulary for that that we and what I'm so fascinated by is Tom's a guy who's been making movies for 40 years. He's still learning. We're 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 still looking at each other and go and on every movie we look at each other and say, didn't we learn this lesson last time? Like, didn't we have this exact same conversation on the last one? Why do we keep having to learn the same damn lesson? That's the beautiful thing about about this business, and that's why there's always so something new, can... new. Yeah, that's amazing. Yes. I mean, and, yeah. and you, and it's why you see certain filmmakers, you know, guys make like two or three hit movies, and then suddenly they make a movie that's not. You, you there is no, there is no. There's no expert level. There's no God tier. Um, yeah. There's not a place at which a filmmaker arrives and they just know how to make movies. Yeah. 
the matter is you get to a level of competency where you think you know what you're doing and then you get kicked in the junk and it's how do you pick yourself up and go back and and make that better and and whether or not you release the movie before it's finished because of a you know some release date or release calendar or bigger agenda or whether you're in a position of saying absolutely not the movie's not good enough we're going to go back we're going to reshoot we're going to reshoot this scene we're going to tweak this thing we're going to keep editing and work it until uh and not everybody has that luxury obviously um and and you and you and you know and top gun is an excellent case of that there were a lot of people who wanted to release it on streaming there were a lot of people who really? just said that, well yeah i mean the pandemic looked like it was never going to end and there were conversations about you know what the movie is just sitting on a shelf for two years that's when when is that when does that happen except when the movie's a problem and they don't know how to market it you know the studio was very happy about the movie we knew the movie worked and, and yeah we didn't know to what level it resonated but we certainly knew we knew when we made the last edit we just said this film is done like we 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 just we we walked away from it feeling very very good about it um that but the fact that it made it into theaters was tom saying this is coming out in theaters no matter yeah. what anybody says the industry is coming back and 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 i made a commitment to these people working in these movie theaters and people whose lives depend on this from marketing all the way down to the kids sweeping up popcorn after the show that's that's our you know that's what we grew up on that's that's a that's a way of life to us that we really believe yeah. in um that could have gone that could have gone the other way I mean, hey, 1.3 billion later, you know, getting Top Gun that much. I mean, that's not not half bad, you know. I'm glad you stuck to your guns on that one. That is, look, it it to me, there was there was a moment when the movie the movie played at CinemaCon, and they and they and shortly there we were in Africa. Tom and I were in Africa shooting uh, part yeah. two, and um. It was, in fact, not long after we uh, shot that CinemaCon intro, and the uh, and the, the social media started to pick up on the movie, and we. That's when I knew we were no. It, it had taken on a life of its own. That's when I knew we had struck upon something that was not just not just in terms of the quality of the movie, but the what what the movie was saying and how the movie was making people feel when they needed to feel it and i i got to tell you more than anything i just felt i felt enormous gratitude i felt real yeah. real gratitude to, to, to have that opportunity to be able to do that and uh and nobody but tom would have been in a position to to do something like that Dude, I mean, totally. I mean, Top Gun Maverick, seeing that in cinemas. I think all your Mission Impossible should be viewed in cinemas, seeing that. I mean, so let me just ask you, you strike me as someone, it's, it's hard. I do, yeah. <laughs> enjoy, it on, enjoy it on your phone, nonetheless. Yeah, you know, just getting on a little a pocket watch, I think, is the best viewing experience. So watch it on the train. Uh, there, there you go. Play the film. Show us the Dead Reckoning trailer on that. Um, but no, it's hard not to see that you just have an immense love for film. And it's really amazing to see what is it about film that you just love so much as a director is it the fact that you can share your story through these large action franchises what is it about film that you love that um, might be an impossible question but no for as long as i can remember uh i have loved telling stories before i could articulate why i love doing it i love telling stories i i love engaging with and moving others to be someone asked me quite recently on social media uh what it was i you know what made me happy and i said the happiness of others i yeah. when, when i when i can sit in a theater and hear 500 total strangers laughing together and gasping together and uh and, and crying together silent together uh you you feel a sense of community you feel a sense of 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 universal belonging um that that to me is the 
is the is the greatest feeling. What cinema does, and I this is going to sound you know like I should have strings playing behind oh, me. Oh, please! <laughs> cinema does what cinema does is it reminds us that we are all human and and that we are all on on fundamental levels the same and uh and that you that i can make a film and travel the world i can go to korea i can go to japan i can go to russia i can go to australia and i can watch audiences watch the same movie laugh in the same places and you know yeah. whether they are whether they are reading the subtitles or whether they're hearing the movie dubbed or whether they're yeah uh, and and that they and and that to me that that's what makes cinema so richly 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 rewarding um and discovering for me personally being a director it's discovering the mysteries of how and why it works and yeah and really the top gun was after 25 years of making movies after uh after at that point 13 years of working with tom of developing movies together making multiple you know, making mission impossible and valkyrie and and going back and studying the original top gun and saying this is why i think top gun works this is what i yeah. think the secret ingredient to the original movie is this is what I think the the the, the an, an audience right now needs, and to deliver a movie like that, and then and then have the movie work, and have the movie have the audience, yeah, pay that 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 and and sort of and grant us not repay that grant us the acceptance of that was the greatest feeling ever, and I especially love that no one has yet figured out what the secret ingredient is so i that's that's my, that's my favorite part of all the speculative press about the movie is, is <laughs> yeah we're waiting until someone cracks it <laughs> uh, but no i mean that point you brought up yeah like my dad's deaf and we went to go see fallout together in cinemas and it was like an amazing experience because visually so strong stuff like i mean like i'm over here in ireland you know far far away from where you make all this so i mean that just shows how far it reaches so you're one day you're not that far you're actually not uh, that far we're in london oh yeah well i'm not that far from you now so i'll fly over there tomorrow and you know yeah i just you can put my big head in the background of one of the films you know and then like i said pay me a couple million i assume that's how hollywood works there's just a legal expectation uh, i if if it if it does i'm Nobody told me. Um, it's okay. I'll just slip in the background. Then you will have to pay me. I know how Hollywood works. I have this all figured out. I'll sell you my 800 page script about Benji. It's his own spin off. So, okay. uh, I mean, it, it's all. It. I'm going to read it. So I'm going to read it overnight. It's all just comes to me naturally. Um, but no, I mean, film can absolutely touch people. You have to do a Mission Impossible in Ireland. I mean, but that's what's been missing. Ethan Hunt, he's not on a big green field with cows and sheep. I feel like that's just, I mean, you've been building up to it. Like the foreshadowing is crazy. So, but, so is that, that your intention for the next one? Is that a spoiler that he's going to be in a big field in Ireland? A big field in Ireland with a bunch of sheep? Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know why I asked you that question. May, I don't know what answer I was the, expecting. may have read in the press recently that, that he was in a big field with some sheep. I don't know if you saw that. There was the... Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. There was a uh, that the she that the set was invaded by sheep. Well, um, for real? Was, like, are you messing or what? Oh, for real. That's a story. Um, and I know why that became a story. And you know, it's it's a it's very it's a uh, we 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 were shooting a sequence out in uh, uh, we were shooting uh, little pickups to a sequence that we shot in Norway, in the Lake District here in the UK, and. Yeah. Um, and you know, and there, and and Tom was doing, um, uh, he was doing uh, an aerial sequence and landing in a, in a field. And there, who knows, there might have been sheep in the field, but certainly nobody called me to say that the set had been overrun by sheep. But you're like, whatever. It's you know, I've also read that he's he's knocked out cows, which isn't true. And he, <laughs> what? What? yeah, all right, oh, just yeah, drop there that. Story, there was some story that we had a drone that. Um, <laughs> That he, he was, was knocking doing, out cows, sky diving, and we had a drone, and the drone terrified some cows, and it caused some panic. And all I'm reading, I'm reading the article and saying, if you put a, if you put Tom on a parachute and a drone in the same basic vicinity, you're gonna, someone's gonna get killed. So I don't know how that 
story started. That's I, you, you don't put drones and, and parachutes together. It's very, it's I'm very glad good. that's how we ended up. It went from me talking about cows and sheep to you talking about a drone story and scaring cows. But yeah, it's went full circle. This is exactly how I imagined the whole Yeah, story. no, I thought you had read the article and that's why you were bringing it up. Oh yeah, there's fully like a sheep story in the in the press about how our set was invaded. So at least I have the exclusive comment by the director. Don't know what that will get me, but I mean, pff, listen, we'll, we'll, we'll take our victories where we can get them. But are you constantly adapting to something like Mission Impossible? Like, you know, when something like that happens, because I mean, I know you've talked about, I mean, it's obviously I'm sure everyone knows this. Tom Cruise broke his ankle. I think it was her fallout or yeah, it was fallout. Yeah, he broke yeah. his ankle. That gave you, I think, two weeks to break. And Rogue Nation, I think you, did you come in when that was kind of already in development and they were kind oh, of I, I came in I came in earlier on Ghost Protocol. I'd actually never talked about Ghost Protocol until Tom started talking about it in the press. I don't usually <laughs> talk about my uncredited work only because I don't, you know, I want people to feel safe when I come in and work on their movies. Um uh, it, uh Rogue Nation, we were really struggling with the end of the movie. We we're having a real hard time working out how the movie, what the action sequence at the end of the film was. We had the A400 stunt. There were people insisting it be at the end of the movie because it was the biggest stunt in the movie. And the problem was that in order to make, to put that shot in a sequence, once Tom gets on the plane, well, what's he going to do when he gets inside the plane? He's got to have a fight with a villain. And that's going to involve into a big fight inside of an airplane, yeah, which yeah. means we're going to have to build the airplane. And the team is going to have to be doing something during that sequence, which means the team's going to do something where they try to stop the plane. And we would have had to, be, and we designed a sequence that was like the most stripped down version that kept everybody in the sequence. And it cost $20 million more to put that at the end of the movie than at the beginning. Well, to me, that was simple math. It was like, well, this is going to the beginning of the movie. And, and in any other world, the studio would be saying to you, you got to cut $20 million out of the budget. Yeah. Is there a way you can just boil this sequence down till it's just about the stunt? And I found myself in the unusual position of being on the other side of that argument and saying, guys, I'm trying to save you $20 million for a sequence that it's just not going to be very good. And they, and we were all in the mindset of, but the third act has to be the biggest act of the movie. It has to have yeah. the biggest act. The, the movie has to, has to reach this cathartic climax. And I went to see Tom at his apartment one night and I said, Here's the problem. I, we keep trying to write sequences where you kill Solomon Lane, Sean Harris's character in the movie, and you guys have this fight, and you know, and it's the thing we've seen in every mission movie. I was like, I don't really have this abiding desire to see you fight and kill Sean Harris. It's just not your relationship. And I'm, I was like, I don't, I'm not feeling kick his ass. I'm, I'm, and and he said, well, what is it you're feeling? And I said. I, kind of feel like you need to outsmart him. He seems more of an intellectual villain than a physical one. And and he said, well, how would you do that? I said, I guess, I don't know. I mean, he caught you in a glass box at the beginning of the movie. It feels only right that you catch him the same way. And as soon yeah. as we let go of the kind of movie you had to make, in 15 minutes, we had the concept of the ending of the movie which was very small and contained yeah. and could fit inside of the, the, the time we had remaining. It, 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 it suddenly it fit within our resources. Now, not every movie is like that. It's, yes. that, oh, yeah. it's not yeah. something, I don't want to encourage executives to just say, oh, I don't care, just make the ending small. We, we had earned that ending and the franchise had earned that ending. Yeah. And we had also discovered something along the way having edited the movie over the Christmas break, which was the emotion of the film, which we had never counted on. And the relationship with Rebecca Ferguson was far deeper and more resonant than we ever, we ever could have dreamed it would be. Yeah. So, so the ending, so the Rogue is, is kind of this weird movie in that it shatters a lot of genre tropes. And I don't want to sound like I'm tooting my own horn because it wasn't intentional any more than, Usual Suspects was not setting out to be a rule-breaking movie. I just didn't know the rules. I didn't, I didn't care. That's very different than breaking the rules. And I caution everybody about breaking the rules for the sake of breaking the rules. It's it's yeah. when you're breaking the rules so that 
because you're you're not in the movie, you're outside of the movie thinking about how people are going to evaluate you for having had the guts to break the rules. Yeah. That's not, that's not a reason to break the rules. That's And you're not in control of that. Um, so Rogue, when we got to the end of the movie, we, we, we realized, oh, that was, the movie just needed it to end. It didn't need to end in some big climatic way. I knew going into Fallout, I can't do that twice in a row. Yeah. So it's all out's got to be big. It's got to be the biggest ending that a mission has ever had. And coming out of Fallout, I realized, oh, well, now I've set a bar. Now Fallout has now has raised a level of expectation to the place where I must now bury Fallout. And worse, in between Fallout and this movie, we had Maverick. And there's now this level of expectation on what we're going to deliver on in terms of action and in terms of spectacle. And then we were doubling down because we had another movie behind that, which was already percolating. So um, you put the Henry Cavill mustache in so you could really one up it. I assume that's where that came from. Henry Cavill actually put the mustache in. I remember the day he came to me. Um, there was a comic book character, the name of which I can't remember. And he showed it to me and kind of he was modeling himself after this he's a big comic book fan and i said yeah that's he had a big beard because he'd just come off of another film where he had a big beard and so he shaved the beard off left the mustache and i said yeah let's just go with it um and it wasn't until i was shooting with him the first day that i realized i'm looking at him through the monitor and he was he had this kind of wry dialogue with tom and he's kind of busting his chops a little bit and i said go home tonight and watch clark gable I want you to go home tonight and watch it happen one night and gone with the wind and take a look at this guy who was in his lifetime. He was one of the great movie stars, but he was a guy who never really considered himself to be an actor. He was, he felt he was trapped as a movie star and he's actually one of the great, truly great screen presences and, um, and uh, an interesting story about Gable, Gable, total sidebar. Gable was in Head a into it. Oh yeah, Gable was in a film called The Misfits with uh, Marilyn Monroe, and it was their last film. They both, they both, uh, yeah, they both died shortly thereafter. Gable saw the rough cut of the film with John Huston, and it's a, and it's a, it's quite a good film. It's written by Arthur Miller, and it's the 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 story behind the making of The Misfits is actually almost a better movie than the making of the movie, the the, the movie itself rather. And Gable watched the rough cut of the film with John Huston. And at the end, he had tears in his eyes. And he said, for the first time in my life, I feel like an actor. And he got on the plane to fly home. And it was a very physical movie at the end. And the physical scene, a very physical scene where he breaks a horse in the desert outside of Reno. And he got on the plane and on the way home had a massive heart attack. At least I, I think I'm getting the story right. Don't quote me. He had a massive heart attack and he died a couple weeks later. Um, mm -hmm. Spends his whole career not feeling like an actor, feeling kind of like a fraud and a movie star, and as as though that was not something to value. Yeah. Um, so it was just very funny when Henry when Henry brought me that and I and I looked at that and said, go look at this guy and and read up on this guy and study his story. And it's a and it you know it's it's Henry Cavill is um he is that and I see a lot of actors there's, I'll make a controversial, potentially controversial statement. There wasn't something in the water in some other era. There's not a reason why there were movie stars then and there aren't stars like that now. Um, during the studio system, they had one sort of mechanism that, that, that made movies and made stars. And now it's very, very dispersed, and and there are different there are different ele there are different elements that control why movies work the way they do, and why some succeed and why some don't. And there is, I believe, a a different set of ambitions, and and a different idea of what movies are supposed to do. And it's and and I see. Um, I see a lot of actors with that enormous potential to be enormous stars. Yeah. Um, and, and, the, and, and a lot of it comes down to choices. A lot of it comes down to the, to the films that they make and the reasons why they make them and 
the noise that they're listening to, what they think they have to live up to, um, and and how the notion of being entertaining is somehow entertainment is somehow a dirty word. Um, okay. It's making big entertaining movies that make people feel great is yeah. almost like people don't want to get caught doing that. And I'm like, I'm just unashamedly here to, to do that. That's amazing. And I love what you said there. There's so, there wasn't something to wire. There is a shift I feel in Hollywood. I mean, you know, especially, I mean, you look at what I'm worried about, because I mean, obviously I, I interviewed a ton of comic book creators. You look at my wall, I'm afraid I'll have someone on who just despises superhero films and I'll kind of turn around. So I'm thinking about getting that, but no, I, I wonder, would you agree with this? And I'm so sorry for taking up so much of your time. I'll, I'll let you go in a minute, but I just, I'd love to ask you no, this. No, it took, it took months for us to get together. I figure, I, you know, I, I, I cleared my calendar. So. Oh, well, listen, I'll take that any day of the week. But do you feel like, I mean, this is just what I feel. Do you feel like superhero movies have kind of become the new Western? Because I don't know, I wasn't really alive when John Wayne was banging out these epics. But nowadays it feels like, you know, I mean, Westerns were obviously very popular in the heyday of Hollywood. But now, they, like, it's... There's superhero media every month. And I mean, I love, obviously, super, and I love what superheroes represent. I mean, you can't look at a character like Superman and see he's not fundamentally a, a symbol of hope. But at the same time, there's I feel there's repetitiveness. Um, I don't know. Do, do you feel like Westerns, that superhero films kind of replace Westerns? Or am I mistaken in that? It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting analogy in that there was a time in, in cinema when Westerns and war movies were kind of the... You know, yeah. that was it. You were, you know, and I grew up watching movies of that era. I'm not a student of the 70s. I'm much more a student of the 40s. Yeah, really? Through, through 60s. Oh, absolutely. The 70s new wave and stuff like that to me is, uh, it's, it's all stuff I really admire. It's just not the stuff I grew up on. I, my 70s cinema is the man who would be king. My 70s cinema is... The, you know, is the seven ups and yeah. uh, the taking of Pelham one, two, three. It's, um, I didn't watch movies like Taxi Driver and, uh, and, and, uh, and Clockwork Orange and movies like that until, until a little later in my adolescence, the movies I grew up watching, you know, and then of course I'm watching Star Wars, which, which blew my mind um, or as another generation calls it, wrongly star wars episode four a new hope it's star wars i'm sorry that's just that's that's how i experienced it that's my article um, there yeah deranged uh, director I, and i when we, we when we sat down to talk about maverick very early on no one can be asked to remember the original maverick no one the original talk um, you can't ask people to even to step outside of the movie into a movie they liked and remember as well as that one it takes At away. No point. Totally. You step out of the narrative. You're asking the audience to do the work for you. Yeah. And and so and and there is a whole spectrum of the audience that loves that work and that is invested in that work. And that work is part of the entertainment. To me personally, movies are for the audience, not an audience. Yeah. That is an audience. The same way critics are an audience, and the academy is an audience. You are the audience. You're the person I'm making the movie for. And, and it's if, not a group of people you're making it for. It's not. I'm not making it for a spectrum of the audience. Now, mind you, there's whole spectrums of the audience that don't care at all about a movie like Mission Impossible. I get that I can't please everybody. Yeah. I want to reach the widest audience possible. I want sure. whoever comes to the movie to not have to leave the narrative for a minute. You know, I can hopefully invest them. And I think that's what you're seeing in terms of the evolution from Rogue to Fallout to Top Gun and hopefully Beyond and Edge of Tomorrow. You're watching Tom and I kind of get just kind of knuckle down on what really matters to keep them in the story and and not ever have to. How do we keep their phone out of their hand? It isn't loud noise. It isn't big spectacle. It's not explosions and chaos and mayhem. It's engagements. It's an investment in that protagonist's journey, and uh, and that's why I I when you talk about westerns, to me, um, Unforgiven is oh yeah uh, Shane and un Shane and Unforgiven or or uh, Stagecoach and Unforgiven with Shane 
as kind of the center tentpole kind of exist as the, as great examples of now, by the way, stagecoach is an ensemble. It's, it's, yeah. it's, a, but there is one story. There's a central love story in that movie that matters. Titanic. It's Rose's story, but it's really Jack and Rose. And it's a, and it's a, it's a love story. Same way Avatar is a love story. Yes. Same way um, Terminator is a love story. You know, Cameron, what Cameron understands and why his movies work so well and why, uh, and why he is in a class utterly by himself is Cameron understands the essence of showmanship is, you know, I just, it's it, all of this uh, helicopters and world building and morphing T2, all of that stuff. That's all amazing. None of it matters if the movie doesn't have, if the movie doesn't have heart, it doesn't, and it doesn't follow a character's journey. Um, so yes, I, so uh, do I think it's the Western, this is all my long rambling answer. No, 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 no. Do, no. I, do I think it's the new Western? Yes. In that it is, that it is the, it is the, the bread and butter. Yeah. Do yeah. I think that that's healthy for, uh, for the industry as a whole? It's really hard to say, does yeah. it, does it feed the industry or does it, feed a more and more and more specific, admittedly large, but very specific audience. Um, yeah. yeah, I- That's I, interesting. I mean, there's a period now I feel, you know, independent films. I mean, I think there's almost kind of a dichotomy when you're putting out these superhero films all the time, you know, and like the Northman, everything everywhere all at once. And then there's like Spider-Man No Way Home and cinemas, all great films in their own right, but you kind of have to worry, I feel. Well, will that will those independent films get the love that they deserve? I mean, when you're putting out all these great works, but do you, that's interesting that point you brought up there about. Well, look, that. they 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 have a theater to go to, yeah, um, because those other movies are there hauling in the big money. That's and and which is great. It's it's yeah. absolutely great. Here's what I here's what I see happening, and I'm probably in a minority. There's there's a wedge that has been driven down the center of cinema and really? my definition your definition they may not be the same people yeah. talk about cinema they actually don't define it and so when people get angry about martin scorsese saying marvel movies are not cinema that's well nobody actually started the conversation by saying what cinema is he only mm -hmm. said what cinema isn't um I have a definition of cinema, just like I'm sure you have a definition of cinema. It's very What's your definition? Um, my definition of cinema is a uh, a a place that you go to to watch movies with other people. That's a good <laughs> definition. That's a great okay. definition. There, there. That's that's what it is. What movie cinema? Like what movies really define cinema to me? Um, if you take if you look at the last, I would say, 30 years and probably really beginning more than anything with the new, with the 70s new wave, but it, it, biz, the, the industry had been kind of going through spasms since the 40s of trying to figure out what it was. You go back to the golden age of Hollywood and, and what movies were, they were mass entertainment. They were mass entertainment. They were made to entertain the masses and stir the soul. To me, cinema is, is something that engages and enriches the audience. Yeah. That, that there are movies that engage the audience, but don't necessarily enrich them. There are movies that enrich the audience, but don't necessarily engage them. And you, you can pick your own definition of what those movies are, but you can see how the industry has slowly divided art and entertainment into two separate categories that are almost mutually exclusive and also look at each other with a little bit of jealousy. Enrichment and engagement. But you look at these two, these two sides of the industry and you look at the, the entertainment side and the engagement side, and I'm looking at the middle and saying, where are the movies in the middle that are, you know, a film that, uh, that, that challenges your notions of life, that stirs your soul. And it's also just a damn good movie. It's just like an entertaining, fun movie that rocked my world and I want to go back and see it again. Yeah. So to me, 
cinema is not, that's why I say to you, cinema is a place where you go to watch movies. My other definition for cinema is it's it's an objective. Cinema is a thing that I that, that I'm aiming for. Yeah. It's a, it's a it's a feeling, it's a vibe, it's a presence. And it's how do I take the mandate of you're making mission possible? Well, how do I take that spy movie, that popcorn film, and actually push it more in the direction of those enrichment those and engagement that, that are enriching. And when I get handed something that is more of kind of, oh, this is kind of more of a melodrama and stuff, Valkyrie, how do we take Valkyrie, which yes. is a film about, you know, about these, about these guys who are struggling with their soul and notions of duty and honor and responsibility. And how do I push that into a place where I can make that for the biggest audience possible? Because who cares if you make an important movie, if you make an issue, a movie about it? about a social issue that everyone needs to be engaged in. Yeah. If only 5,000 Academy voters come to see it, it's kind of missed the point. And those are films that for me are the movies that need that. And, and, and it's, and, and, and wouldn't you want that film to reach the widest part of possible audience? What the, what the industry has trained us to believe is that you must be one or the other. You are an artist or you are an entertainer. Yeah. And that, and and I'm looking at it saying, why can't you be both? Why can't you be neither? Why can't you be, why can't you be something that, that what, you know, why don't we all just look at movies and say that if we all work on our movies, A, to support one another, instead of looking like Ooh, this movie beat that movie this weekend, Screw that. We're not, I want everybody to win. I don't want to beat anybody. I want every movie to make $100 million yeah. in its opening week. Totally. There are enough sense. seats. Yes. And there are enough seats for those movies to do it. And I think there's an appetite for people who want to go. It's It's been proven. If you build it, they will come. If you make a movie that people want to see, they will come and see it. And it must be nowadays. It's got to be a cultural event. It's got to be a movie that everybody's going to be talking about on Monday. So I got to go. I don't want to miss it. I want to be part of the conversation. Yeah. When I ask people at your age why they go to see movies, they tell me because I have to. I, I got to see it because they're all going to be talking about it on yeah. Monday. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. certainly the case. I mean, you know, if absolutely. You that, and that, that element of entertainer v artist, um, that's so fascinating because you see all these filmmakers who grow grown up watching stuff like Jaws. And Jaws is one of my favorite films. I love Jaws. I, I watched it in cinemas just last week because they put it back in cinemas. So me and my friends watched yeah. it. Big Amazing. And but Jaws, I mean, it's a bit of a silly film in a way. I mean, you know, it's a it's a shark that goes Look around. What Jaws is? I'm gonna give you three movies. I'm gonna give you three movies. Okay. All right. And and I, I'm gonna take three filmmakers, three filmmakers who are regarded as some of the greatest filmmakers that, that ever lived. Uh, yeah. They all movie. started by making genre movies. One made an alien movie, one made a monster movie, and one made a gangster movie. Yeah. Ridley Scott, Steven Spielberg, and Francis Ford Coppola. They made yeah. Jaws, they made Alien, and they made The Godfather. Those movies in the hands of other filmmakers would have just been, they would have been genre B movies. What you did is you yeah. took a filmmaker who really took the, the art of cinema seriously and applied it to mass entertainment. Now, that's really interesting. Know, You'd have to then you'd have to then interview those filmmakers and ask them what they thought about it. I know that Coppola. I was listening to his commentary on The Godfather. You know, thirty years later or however many years later, and he was he was actually like still pining over shots in the movie that he he was forced to compromise because of budget and yeah and he was and you could see there was a guy who was still wrestling with the success of his movie. He was still wrestling with the success of his movie because I don't think Coppola ever set out. I think Coppola looks at The Godfather as, you know, it's the, that's that was the genre movie I had to do to in order to get to do the things I really wanted to do. Now, really? I, 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 maybe, I don't know, don't quote me on that. I just yes. know, I just quoted me on your podcast. But I was <laughs> listening to Coppola kind of lamenting the, the elements of the movie and I'm looking at it and going what's amazing is we will never see Godfather the way Coppola will and Coppola will never see Godfather the way we do 
the way we do. And 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 I'm thinking how God, Cop I wish Coppola could just sit down and watch the guy. You could erase his mind and he could just watch The Godfather. Because I think Coppola would watch it and go, that was awesome. I know James Gray is a filmmaker I've known since, oh, since he was I, in yes. school. Amazing. And James Gray is that guy who's just like, he's... He he holds himself to such an exacting standard, and he's he's so utterly principled about film, and he is he is such a lover of Visconti and Scorsese and Coppola, and and I look at James Gray and I'm like, let me produce a movie for you so that you can take all of that skill and just make one really fucking entertaining heist movie. Yeah, like, yeah. because like Soderbergh, Soderbergh, be Soderbergh does these studio flicks, and they're just studio films to a different level, you know. And then he quit the movie business because it kind of kills him making those studio movies. And I, mean, I didn't know and, that. And it, well, I, I, it's, I, I, again, I, yes, it's what I understand. I could be totally wrong, but I remember when Soderbergh said he was retiring for film, and and he he really like you know he went and made uh, uh, what was that show the, the medical show with Clive Owen, um, uh, the where he's the doctor at the turn of the century. Um, I look it up. The Nick. The Nick. Which was extraordinary, and Soderbergh, it, it's it's Soderbergh. I and he knows how to email me, and he can tell me I totally got this wrong if this blows back. But he, it, it felt to me like he was tired of dealing with the bullshit. He was tired of dealing with the executives. He was tired of dealing with the notes and the stuff you had to do. And he got to go and do the Nick, which was kind of his process. He would shoot the show. He'd edit it on the on the way home from work that day, and you know yeah. he was he got to do all the stuff he loved. And the Nick is extraordinary. It's really, really extraordinary. Um, and 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 so and that's great. I, I just to me, I look at it and go, I'm not in this to do it for me. I'm not in this to do it yeah. so that you can. I'm I'm not in it for 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 the small group of people who might find what I'm nerding out on. Yeah, that that to me is a is a withdrawal, not a deposit. I'm interested in making movies that that feed the if, that feed the, the 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 cinema, meaning the the theater where people go to watch movies yeah. and enrich the audience in such a way that they want to come back and see it again. That's my job. That's my mission. That's yeah. really what I'm I'm focused on. That to me is the triumph of Top Gun. It's not the box office. It's the fact that people were going back to see it again and yeah. going back to see it again. And then when it came out on streaming, they were watching it again. That, to me, the greatest review, the greatest success you can ever hope to achieve is a repeat viewing. As somebody who watches your movie and say, I like that experience so much, I'd like to experience again. Knowing the outcome, I'd like to see the movie again. Knowing the outcome actually makes the experience that much better for me. Um, that, to me, is the ultimate. That's the goal. I mean, totally. But what's so fascinating, you said Francis Ford Coppola could never watch The Godfather. That's the same for you at Mission Impossible, right? You'll never watch that how I'll watch it. You know, no matter what. Because is that the same? It evolves. You it, 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 it's funny. It evolves. What I do, I study it. I don't. Really? I'm not, I'm not able to watch The Usual Suspects. And, you know, obviously, I was the I was the first person to know what the twist of The Usual Suspects yeah. I was. I, I, I I was the I was the first spoiler on that movie. I, but I have learned so much now that all I look at when I see suspects is the is the the inexperience of everybody making those movies and really the, and and the, and the and the oh and there's just and and for years what I couldn't articulate about the things that rubbed me the wrong way about the movie that now I know why they bother me and how to fix them and that pain that that anxiety is with me every day when I'm lining up a shot now. So now when I'm on set framing, it's, it's not enough to say, I've got Daniel Fee and I got three pages of dialogue and he's sitting in a chair, put him in the chair, do this thing and shoot the dialogue. Yeah. The dialogue yeah. doesn't matter. It, it's, it's no matter how important the dialogue is, yeah. the dialogue doesn't matter. What matters is that when I frame the shot, I'm compelled by what I'm seeing in the frame before Daniel Fee has started speaking. Yeah. And if I and if I do that correctly, you the the dialogue will become effortless to listen to. 
I'll only need to hear key words. I can be immersed in a movie instead of concentrating on it. Yeah. That, and and, and so we kind of got away with murder on usual, on usual suspects because it's very dialogue intensive and there's a lot of stuff we need to retain. Now I, and dialogue was very, very important to me when I made The Way of the Gun. Yeah. I, I do not care one bit if you are listening to the dialogue. I care about every single word not for whether or not you are listening to the words, but that in the event you are listening to the words, they're not distracting you or confusing you or creating questions in your mind that I don't want you asking. So and it's so all I'm visual right storytelling. It's, it's visual storytelling and it's character dynamics. And the, yeah. the dialogue is music. It matters that the people are talking doesn't matter that you're listening to what they say. It can't, I can't make it important for you to listen. If, if I do that and you stop listening, you've missed a vital part of the movie, yeah. which is why I choose where for you to be looking when I'm saying certain things. It's why I write lines of dialogue that I know you won't be listening to because you, you'll be thinking about what, what other thing is happening during the conversation. Yeah, But if there was no dialogue there, there would be air in the scene and you would be disengaged. So I'm, I'm, and be thanks to that audience in that movie theater all those years ago, I'm kind of acutely aware of the experience the audience is having while we're making the movie. Tom will say to me all the time, I don't need to say this line. And I said, absolutely right. You don't, I need you to say it because I'm going to be, I'm going to, that's going to be happening off camera. This is happening. The audience yeah. isn't going to be listening. Or the line that comes after it is important. And if it happens before some before the first sentence says, da -da 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 -da, the first sentence is just getting your ear to listen. And then I cut to you for the really important part. Yeah. You're not hearing all of the dialogue and fallout. But if you go and watch fi fallout, try to ignore the dialogue and fallout and see what happens. The dialogue is actually, for much of the movie, demanding your attention it's also why i get dinged all the time for writing stiff and you know i there are people who look at my dialogue and say oh it's hammy dialogue it's this that and the other thing yeah but you follow the story you yeah it's like story. you said you're constantly trying to make a silent film in mission impossible yes would, yeah would you tie that back that's so fascinating to me you know that idea of dialogue and the way you can use it and the way you i, I think i think that's probably because you're a screenwriter you have that perspective you know like if you weren't a screenwriter do you think you feel that way no, I think screen, quite the opposite. Screenwriting, screenwriters, think, you know, they, they think of everything in terms of the written word and they fear the fact that his dialogue is being taken away, their writing is being taken away. The best scene I ever wrote in my life was a scene without dialogue. Really? I mean, I, absolutely. What I think is, you know, not the... Uh, you, uh, the opera think, sequence in Rogue Nation? The which one? The opera sequence. Um, I don't even think, you know, it's funny you said that. I didn't even think of that, but that's a sequence with no dialogue. Like there's a sequence, that, but, but it's, that's a different emotion. Yeah. The, the, I was so, the first time I ever, uh, it was a scene in Valkyrie and it's, Tom was saying goodbye to his family. He was putting them in a car and sending them away, knowing that he was probably never going to see them again. And Tom came to me and he said, I think she should get out of the car and run back to me. And all I was thinking was, the director's going to hate that. The director's going to hate the emotionality of that. And it's just like, and he's going to think that's so melodramatic. And I want to give Tom what he wants, but I don't want to have this big battle. And I could see the way that it, that the, the idea would be it rejected because, oh, there's going to be dramatic music playing and it's going to be this, you know, it's going to be something out of, a, out of an old 40s movie. And I realized if I put him in the plane flying to kill Hitler and while he's listening to the engines of the plane, you cut to his family. And instead of music, the scene of the family is scored with the engines of the plane over this long slow motion shot of her getting out of the car and coming back to him and kissing him and saying goodbye to him. And then without ever showing his face, she runs back to the car. Well, I wrote that scene and then they shot that scene and I saw that scene in the first assembly of the movie and I was like, that's the, 
That's the, and it was the first time I'd written something that actually emotionally affected mm -hmm. me, you know, that I could watch it and go, I could be outside of it and why, and I could put myself in the audience and feel what was occurring. It was, I had discovered emotions. That was like, that's a critical moment for me as a, as a writer. Then when we were watching the next assembly of the movie, she gets out of the car, the engines are roaring and she runs up to him and kisses him. And then we cut, she doesn't go back to the car. And John Ottman, the editor was sitting in front of me. He was sitting at the Abbott. I was in the back of the room, his couch. And as soon as I cut one, I went, I was like, why did you cut? But I didn't say it. I went to say it. And John was sitting with his back to me. Went, <laughs> he knew, he knew right away. He was like, he's going to react and, and he's going to speak too soon. And it's true. I do. I'm, I'm, I'm totally emotionally dysregulated. And then we get to the end of the film and Stauffenberg is spoiler has been executed and he's laying there on the ground. There was originally the movie was supposed to end with a crane shot that went from his eye up to the night sky and the bombers were coming to flatten Berlin, which was something that was lost from the first act of the movie, the notion that Berlin was being bombed. And I'm, I have real problems with the first act of Valkyrie and, and what it doesn't do to establish yeah. Nazi Germany. But because those things had been sort of tossed out at the beginning, they didn't really make sense in the sure. end. And John understood that he cut to Stauffenberg and he cut back to the rest of that shot. And yeah. it was Carissa and kissing Tom and then running back to her car. And the last image of the film is Stauffenberg's family getting away to an uncertain fate. And then the title cards come and they tell you, you know, what happened to them. Yeah. And that, and so the, what at what to the up to that moment had been the best scene I felt I'd ever written became the two best scenes I felt I'd ever written. Yeah. And it was also brilliant editing on John Upton's part for John to be able to see the power of that and the emotion of that and when to use that power and emotion. It didn't matter that Berlin was being bombed. The story was about his family. And that's what Tom understands. It's like, it's not long live sacred Germany is an abstract concept. My wife and my children the people I most care about getting away to safety and escaping this, this horror. And yeah. that's what makes the film more universal. And Tom never asked us to change the movie and make the movie more commercial. He just wanted the movie to be more emotionally engaging. And that's, and that's all we, that's all we focus on. Do you ever have to worry about making it commercial? I mean, you know, because, you know, I mean, well, I love that you can work in that studio atmosphere and still make, an original creation. It's something I'm so baffled by and I'll never understand how you, because so many directors have talked about that process, but you seem to come on, make a great film while it being a big, large blockbuster studio. Make it emotional, you're making a commercial. I don't care what anybody says. Make it emotional and you're making a commercial. You really? make it important. You make it important, you're not making a commercial. You're making it important to people who think it's important. If, if, if Without the emotion, it's why people go. It's what they are paying for. It is the contract we have signed. It's what they're asking for when they come to the movie. It's yes. what every note you will ever receive on anything you ever create. The subtext of every note is help me like your art. Help me like your craft. Help me like your story. People just want to be moved. And they and what they really want, what I if after 30 years of doing this, what they really want is a sense of justice. It's not a happy ending. That's very different. They don't want a happy ending. Yeah. They want a just ending within the moral universe you have created. Chinatown is not a happy ending. But it's the right it's ending. The, it's the, it's, it, it adheres to the sense of justice in the world you are thrown into. And you are told in the first five minutes, these are the rules of this world. This this is how this world works. It's a loveless, cold-blooded, hardcore world. And our and our main character is a cynic. He's a cynical, cynical character who's who, who does not believe in love. And yeah. he is a, he is an exploiter and profiter in other people's pain. And that guy's going to experience some real pain before this story is over. Chinatown is endured. Chinatown is endured, despite the fact that it's a very it's a grim, black, dark ending. But as you said, it's it's the right one, the the uh, the and and when and so when you look at a movie that's 
you know, they're, you know they, like Top Gun Maverick. Top Gun Maverick could have ended 20 minutes earlier. Yeah. And and people would have walked away from that movie feeling like that was the resolution to this character. That was an emotional story that resolved this character. It did not, however, resolve the emotional, the core emotional relationship in the movie. It did not create a resolution between Rooster and Maverick. And so yeah. while the movie would may have been a, 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 a emotionally rewarding on many, many levels, it would have been, it would have left you unresolved. It would have left you with a feeling of injustice. Now, this concept was one that I was not able to articulate until I started making Mission Seven, and it was, um, and it was, it was because people ask me about the movies that I'm working on, yeah, and and they're asking me about movies in the past. It really bothers um, a lot of fans of Mission Impossible that Jim Phelps died in the first movie. Yeah, really. Yeah, and it, it really resonates with people, and they and I'm asked about it all the time. And it wasn't until I realized it's, and it's only fans of the series who are looking at that. They've kind of got a preconceived notion of who Jim Phelps is, and that suddenly that that wasn't what they wanted. What you see in fandom, what you see with with uh, what's 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 called toxic fandom. Yeah. I experienced it with a movie that wasn't a superhero movie. I experienced it with The Way of the Gun. I delivered a movie that deliberately didn't manipulate you and left you and remained ambiguous and did not bring the story to you. And people hated it. They were angered by it. They were frustrated by it. There's a spectrum of people who enjoy that movie. But I foolishly believed I was making that movie for the audience, not and audience. Now, if I had set out to make it only for people that I thought would appreciate it, that would be a successful film, yeah. not financially, but it would be successful in that I did what I set out to do. I, yeah. I honored that commitment. The, the, your, your, what you see all the time are films that, that fight that notion of what they've, of what they've got to, of what they've got to deliver. And you're seeing in Star Wars, a generational fandom that expects a certain universal justice from Star Wars. Yeah. And they feel themselves being given something that that's not what they've come to expect. They feel the contract is being altered. And that's and you see the emotion that that creates in people. People just get it. You you can complain about it all you want. You can criticize people about it all you want. Yeah. You can say, "Oh, that's talking." You can try to shame people all you want. Yeah. What a movie is when a movie is working, it creates another reality. It puts you in it and it immerses you in it emotionally. Yeah. Fuck with that at your peril, because you're fucking with somebody else's other reality. Yeah. Pardon me. Pardon my language. Feel free to. Beat it's like it. these videos make no money. Say what you want. Honestly, it makes no difference. Okay, great. You so you you got to look at that and say. And again, it's not about servicing the audience. It's yeah. not. I don't. I I totally respect fans. I can't. I have no time for fandom. I have no time for fandom for the simple reason that you are an audience. You are not the audience. Yeah. You're, I yeah. hope to include you in the audience. I ain't making the movie for you. I'm they want it for something them. specific from you. They, what, no, fans just get super protective about the things that they love. Yeah. And, and they've come to expect a certain, a certain justice within it. So when, when, so when you start to muck with that in ways that don't feel genuine and don't feel ingrained within the justice of that universe, they react. And I learned that lesson. I learned it. I was very lucky to have learned it on a very small movie a very long, long time ago. Yeah. Don't mess with that. You can challenge the audience. You can torture the audience. Never punish the audience. Yeah. Never make the audience. And, and, and Hitchcock was the king. He knew how to make them suffer. He said the secret is the secret of suspense is make the audience suffer as long as possible. He didn't torture you. He didn't punish you. And he never, ever, ever in his successful movies, he never broke with their sense of justice. Whether it's Psycho, which is a very dark ending, 
or whether it's North by Northwest, which had a which had a very a very happy ending. He also knew that logic and reality are hugely overrated and kind of irrelevant, and that what really matters is realism and emotion. You you have to be emotionally engaged in the movie. That that logic only matters when elements of the story are taking you out of the narrative. Yeah. And so I listen to these people, uh, you know, I, all these fan, film fans on Twitter um, who complain about the logic of things. And, and so it's like, I, I I don't know how to help you, man. You're like, you want a logical movie. You're go watch a documentary. Movies yes. are, yeah. you, you can't make a movie without the careful application of bullshit. You just can't. Yeah, there's always an audience, I feel, for whatever you're trying to make. But like, you know, you can't let them really get to your head. You can't make a film, you know, for that toxic part of the fandom because it'd be unfair. It wouldn't it wouldn't work for the world. You know, you can. You you can. And they and they would see, look, you could make if 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 I was gonna make a Star Wars movie tomorrow, if I was yeah. gonna make a Star Wars movie tomorrow, the first thing I would do is I'd shoot it on film. I I shoot it I shoot it exactly the way George Lucas did I would I would I would use the the rules of George Lucas's universe um, to make a movie like uh, that was Mom's Home's co Home Cooking I have my movies that I grew up on and when you mess with them I I get I get very upset like everybody else yeah. does it's it's personal it's deeply deeply personal. If you're going to make a Star Wars movie tomorrow, I would I would make a movie that that fans of Star Wars would absolutely love. I wouldn't make it for for fans. I, I wouldn't be doing that because it's personal it. to you. People would will like it because it's yeah, your. Star I would Wars. I would be I would be honoring the contract of what Star Wars is, and you could do it by ticking all the other boxes that modern movies are asked to tick. You can do it in a way that is organic, and you can you can do it in a way that would that would, would and, and but again, it's very very important. This this dangerous attitude of making the fans feel heard, respected, whatever else it is, that's that's that that's a very dangerous dangerous place to be, and it's unnecessary. Make your just understand. The internal sense of justice that your film has promised and deliver on that promise. Success, it's not money, it's not awards, it's not reviews. Success is honoring your commitments. Yeah. The movie, the movie makes a commitment in the first five minutes, and I don't care what movie it is. I don't care if it's an intentional commitment or not. In the first five minutes of the movie, you've seated me in a certain reality, and that reality has unconsciously communicated to me the way this is all going to end. I don't know how seven is going to turn out. Yeah. But I, I'm not surprised by the way seven turns out yeah, yeah. after the first five minutes of seven. It's not that you're making a movie that is predictable. You're making a movie that is true to itself. You're making a movie that adheres to its own sense of justice. Seven is, is a perfect movie almost in terms of its sense of justice. It's my understanding. I heard recently, it's pretty fascinating that Morgan Freeman was supposed to be the one to kill John Doe and not mm. and not Brad Pitt. And if you go back and watch the movie, you see that the whole movie is setting that up, and that you and you you realize that that was a completely different emotional resonance to that to that movie. And I just got to interview Andy Kevin Walker. Do you know Andrew Kevin Walker? He, he wrote. Seven. I do know Andy. I know him. I know him somewhat, and he's brilliant. A brilliant yeah, writer. That's that's so. I'd love to ask him. I had heard this, and I don't know it's true. But as soon as it was told to me, I went, "Oh my god!" Like, of course. Like you watch the whole movie, and you realize it's all being set up. For that and Morgan Freeman's entire story. It of course then makes Morgan Freeman the protagonist of the story. Yeah. And and so there is that you can see that you can see that balance. You can see that sort of thing that there. But also Fincher. Fincher's whole design is he he doesn't he doesn't want to be constrained by those rules. Fincher yeah. likes Fincher likes to kind of mess with you a little bit. He likes to throw you off, and 
and and there are and there are a lot of filmmakers like that where you see that Paul Thomas Anderson is a guy who knows how to color in the lines. He just doesn't want to do it. Picasso knew how to knew how to paint classic paintings. He just didn't want to do it. And you know, and that's and and that's where those and and, and that's where those filmmakers kind of make their that's where they make their bones is they 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 wrestle with that uh they 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 wrestle with that uh that constraint they wrestle with those conventions yeah and, and yeah and yes. you see coppola you see coppola as a guy really struggling with that but also having to deliver on the godfather and i'll bet it killed him i bet it was a really painful agonizing process every day making you know making that movie that was kind of like you know he didn't have the power he didn't have the control that he had in later movies he was, you know, he was, he had to prove himself. Spielberg, when he made Raiders of the Lost Ark, he had to prove himself. Yeah. And he, he had to show that he could, you know, that he could, that he could make that movie and that he could make that movie at a, at a, at a, at a certain level. And, uh, and, and you feel those, those rules really working Spielberg into, you know, some of his, some of his best work. You need those constraints. You need those restrictions. They're, they are, they appear to be, uh, a, a prison. They appear to be things that are that are that are seeds of compromise. I mean, yeah, that idea of working inside the construct, like the the restraints of your universe. I think that's obviously something in Mission Impossible as well. Like, there's only so much you can do with a character like Ethan Hunt. So, when you've been doing this, is there a definitive ending? Is this all shifting somewhere? You know, because you've set up the universe, the rules of this universe. Is this all kind of colliding into Dead Reckoning? Um. Every every mission we've made is, you know, has it's you know, Rogue Nation. Every mission had come to that. Fallout. Every mission had come to that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> are you are you asking me how it all ends? Well, listen. If you want to say it, there you can just tell us. I mean, you brought it up, so fair enough. The, the the fun the fun of these movies is even if I knew yeah. how it how it ended, even if I thought I knew how it ended, even if I told you the ending. Couldn't guarantee that's what the ending would be. Yeah, we that's will make amazing. this. We'll we'll make this film, assemble the whole thing, look at it, and say, and and then look at it honestly, look at it objectively, sit back and look at it as the audience, and try to be you watching the film, yeah. and say, what is, it, what I like to say all the time is, prep is the movie you want to make. Yeah. Production is the movie you think you're making. Post is the movie you actually made. Oh, and man. there was a and, and there was a moment in Top Gun where Tom said, you know, he, he had ambitions for Top Gun and he was and he was like, you know, and he was struggling with it and he was he was there, there were these things he he felt that were most important and he said, "How do we get that?" We're midway through the production. He said, "How do we get that?" And I said, "You don't." That doesn't matter anymore. Let's go into the editing room right now and find yeah. out what movie you made. Let's who who cares what you set out to do? That just got you out of bed in the morning. And we went and we looked at the film with fresh eyes and said, "Oh my God! Like here's a movie we never would have made yeah. had we, you know, had we not been constrained." It's fine to have those ambitions. You can't become obsessed with them. You can't become so focused on the plan that you miss some better movie. There would be no fallout if we had made the movie we set out to make. There would, and and the movie we set out to make changed in a single afternoon because of a scene Tom Cruise did with Vanessa Kirby. Tom was playing a whole different character in Fallout. And we shot Vanessa's side of the scene first. Amazing. And her character changed while we were shooting it because we started to realize, never mind what we wrote in the script, look at what Vanessa can do and play with those strengths and look at that attitude. And the tone of the scene changed and her character changed. And when I turned the camera around on Tom, I thought, the guy you're playing in this scene doesn't belong in a scene with this person. She'd never tolerate what your she'd never tolerate your side of the scene. So we had to rewrite his character and throw out a huge subplot of the movie. That's so, and that's all for the sake of his scene partner. That's that's Tom, that is how Tom yeah. functions. And that's what he gives to the people around him, understanding that the more I give to the people around me and the better they are, the better the movie is. And the more that 
the more that serves my role in it, all boats rise with the tide. Instead of looking at it and going, what do I get out of this? Yeah. Tom's whole perspective is, what can I give to everybody else so that they can give to the movie? Because in the end, his ultimate objective is your experience. Yeah, it's not about the audience. Being, it's not about being Tom Cruise, star of the movie. It's about your coming and enjoying that movie and having that that great experience. And that's so that's the um, anyway. That's that's the 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 the, 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 the what, so when we look at Mission Impossible. When you're asking, you know, what is this and how does it culminate? I don't know. I think I know. I think I know. We'll have to I'm, wait and see I, if your version is I do, I do not know. I do not know the last scene of part two. I don't know it. I I know I know what I want the audience to feel. Yeah. And 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 what I want them to feel is not remotely what people expect I want them to feel. Uh, you know what they're predicting yeah. about things. I, I, to me, it, it matters in a movie like this that you that you that you come away with a specific feeling. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but that that, that in movies like this, you come away with with a specific. You'll come feeling. away thinking there should have been more sheep in this film. There should have been many more sheep in this film. There can always be more sheep, um, but that that this movie's it's, it's so so long, long as the movie adheres to its sense of justice. You know, now when we watched the assembly of seven, we were able. There were scenes in the movie that we hadn't shot yet. There was a scene we knew we were gonna, we were gonna reshoot because mission. You, it's the exposition scenes. It's the 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 stuff that sets up the reasons in the movie that you tend to shoot more than once because it's just kind of it yes. seats the audience in the narrative. So we knew these specific things we were gonna reshoot. When we put the whole, whole movie together, we realized. Oh, thank God we're reshooting those scenes because now, now look what we can do with the movie. Look how we can contextualize all of these emotions. Yeah. And in one hour, I wrote, you know, three pages that changed the entire third act of the movie. Amazing. But only because I was able to sit down and look at the entire thing together and say, you know, look what we did and look at what, look at what the feeling we were after and, and look at the feeling we ended up. Yeah, creative. look at what we built and how can we... Yeah, that's really amazing. Yeah. Uh, Chris, my second yeah. last question. My second, I, I swear it's my second last one. What's your dream project as a filmmaker? I say to you, any job, any... Is there a world or any IP or is it continuing to do your own stuff? What is your dream job? There, I'll tell you, I'll be very honest with you. There used to be, you know, for years I wanted to do Alexander the Great. I wanted to do a project about John Wilkes Booth. And I wanted to do those movies because I was comparing them to other movies that that i wanted to one day be compared to and yeah. that's not the way you do it i don't think of things in those terms anymore i to me it is the um I, when you see dead reckoning part one and two they contain every movie that someone didn't let me make Wow. Every every movie I dreamed of making, some element of them are are in these movies. Movies that I loved and never dreamed of making are in these movies. Um and and after this, all I really want is um is the is the next challenge. I just, you know, that's why when we're you know, the, the projects Tom and I are talking about, um they're I I can't wait to apply what we've learned on this movie to to ideas like that. Would you ever join the superhero world just out of curiosity, or is that, are you more content doing your stuff with like Mission Impossible and stuff? Um, I well, I'll tell you that my my sensibilities have grown more and more grounded. I've become more and more. I've developed a greater and greater appreciation of the notion of vulnerability. Um, I, I suppose I would approach those worlds if I were, if I were allowed to, if I were allowed to, to take them where I think they need to go. I, I don't, I don't 
I don't know necessarily that the, the the kind of movies I like and the the it, it would fit into the philosophy yeah of 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 that and and look it doesn't matter what world you put me in you put me in superhero world you put me in science fiction you know you name a franchise I'm going to make the movie that's going to be the, that's 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 designed to make the maximum return. I want people to come and see the movie. I want there to be a big audience. I want the movie to make a lot of money so that I can go on making movies. No one's ever got to worry about me coming into their franchise and going, I'm going to blow this whole thing up so I can be the guy who did that. Yeah. I'm the guy who's going to come in and go, I'm going to blow this whole thing up because it's going to be massively entertaining. That's what Sam Raimi did with Spider-Man. Yeah. That's what John Favreau did with Iron Man. And you know, and so, and I look at those guys, and I'm like, "That's how you do it." It's it's a tightly controlled universe with with a much bigger plan going on. I'd probably be better in that, better serving them in that universe as a producer, as a as a you know, as a as somebody backstopping whoever that person is and saying, "You know, this will be more emotional if you do this," and you know. Yeah. It, you're you're part of a collective. You're part of a you're part of a bigger mechanism, and I don't have a problem doing that. I, ju- I don't have a problem doing that. Um, do I want to? Do I want to deal with the 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 reaction to those movies? Yeah. Yes, I'll take that on if I'm completely in control. Yeah. Because 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 then, you know, if I'm going to get the shit beat out of me on the internet, it's because it was it was my mistake. It's not because something somebody else ordered me to do. It's, it's and 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 the move and the move. But keeping in mind, the movie I'm going to make is what I believe is going to be the most massively commercially successful movie imaginable. I look at those I look at those fans and I hear them. I hear them and I understand. I think I understand why they are why they are upset, why they're angry. I don't agree with their methods. I, yeah. I, I find all of that to be, I, I don't think anything that they say or do and the hurting of other people is justified. And, no. it's, and it is, and it is, I'm sorry to report, it is only a movie. It's just mass entertainment. Yeah. And truthfully, guys, to, to all of you out there, if you want, if you want to see the, the superhero movie if you want to see Brainiac fight Superman, follow everything I'm telling you about how to make big, massive commercial movies so that you can... And look at Ryan Johnson, who you love to criticize, as a guy who got to Star Wars in four moves. Yeah, not five. You can get there, too. And you and, and you can you can be the one to make your own, and you can be the one to face the consequences when the fans don't like what what you did, um, would I would I do that if somebody came to me and said, "What do you want to do?" If and 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 if I was really I was I was very excited talking about Superman with Henry Cavill. I it just can't, but because not because oh I love Superman and I get to make my Superman. Yeah. I love working with Henry Cavill, and I love Superman when I watched it. You know the Richard Donner movie, and I don't think. Superman's done anything like that since then. And I also love a broken toy. And so I was kind of looking at that, like, I just, you give me a story and it doesn't matter if it's comic books and, you know, I'll dive in. I I said something, I misspoke. I said, I said in an interview, I'm not a comic book guy, I'm a story guy. And it upset people because they're like, comic books are great stories. I was like, it didn't mean the comic books don't have story. I wouldn't make a comic book movie because I'm a fan of comic books. I wrote Wolverine. Yes. The, the, my draft of Wolverine because I saw, I was like, I can write that shit out of this movie. I can write the shit out of this character. And I also know because of the internal politics and the mechanism that I'm working working through that not a word of what I write will make it to the screen. I'm just, I'm my, I'm, I'm, I'm an engine that's getting something started and that, and that I'm not going to be the author of this. I'm not going to be along for the ride. But I'm gonna. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna get. Really, I took the meeting so I could meet Hugh Jackman. That's that's why I did it. Um, 
<laughs> Lovely way, and, amazing. Yeah. So, um, you know, I look. Never say never. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm. I'm. I'm not averse to it. I'm not hugely fascinated in it. I've. I've. I've, I've had Top Gun Maverick changed the way I will make movies. Yeah. Post, man. I can post imagine. Mission Impossible. Um, you know, I had already started Mission when when we were finishing Top Gun Maverick. Uh, I'll never make movies the same way again because of that experience. Um, and I, I, well, I'll tell you what I would love to do. I'd love to apply that the, the the lessons learned from Top Gun Maverick to those universes. I'd love I'd love for them to open the door and to let ideas like that in. And and I I would love Bond to to open the door and kind of let that stuff in. I would love. Uh, you you name a franchise, I I would just it's it, it's all that thing that I'm talking about where it's like you know do we can we uh, striving towards that striving towards that middle so, to an emotional core and and I and it's Marvel's really the only one doing it. Marvel are the only movies that really are reaching for that kind of emotional connection, kind of unashamedly. And they get dinged for it. And I, I got to say, I'm like, you know, you may be making the movie for an audience and not the audience. Yeah. But Kevin Feige is after the right thing. Man. He's, he's after the right thing. He's, he's, that's, that's, you, it's just, I just want to go to a movie and feel something. Yeah. Amazing, man. I'd love to see you join that world. But at the same time, I love seeing you do your own stuff. My last question, Chris, for I swear, I'm, I, I cannot apologize enough. Uh, what advice would no, you have? No what advice would you have for anyone looking to become an uber successful director and screenwriter such as yourself? I mean, I, I say it'd be different for both of them. Uh, what advice would you have for anyone looking to become a director? And You know, it's the same advice I give to everybody. Don't ask permission to do it. Yeah. And you got to, you have to go out and do it. You, nothing will teach you how to succeed like failure. Um, you, you need to go out, fall on your face, embarrass yourself. You need to make crappy movies to make good movies. You need to make mistakes to learn how to be. You have to fail to succeed. And uh, and that the entire business is arrayed in such a way that you are you are made to ask permission to, for permission from people who will never ever give it to you. Most yeah. of them are not in the in the position of authority to give it to you. Many of them don't know how to make movies, so they wouldn't recognize the makings of a good one if it bit them on the ass. They're, uh, they're, it, 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 all of the decisions that are being made are fear-based, and they're all centered around risk mitigation, not risk-taking. Um, you find people around you who have the same passion that you do and make movies, and you can make all the excuses you want you can make all the reasons for why you can't do it, why you don't have the time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I have never been able to help telling stories. I have never been able to, to stop myself, as it's pretty obvious from our conversation, from <laughs> telling stories and, and connecting with people through, a, through, a, uh, a, through, through, an, through an interaction that way. If it's in you, nothing can stop you from doing it. And what... And, and the, the, the biggest mistake that I made in those seven years, and I made a lot of big mistakes. I pissed a lot of people off. I held a lot of grudges. I did a lot of things on principle instead of playing the game politically. I, I can chart every reason why I am, I, I have the struggles I have today back to times I shot myself in the foot. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not blaming those seven years on anybody but myself. Within that, the biggest mistake I made was believing that if I wrote a screenplay and wrote a good screenplay and went around asking permission and submitted it, that I would be delivered. I was told that early on. Write a good screenplay and you'll be delivered. It's horseshit. It's it's not how movies get made, not how the majorities of, of them get made. You can cite. Anybody, you can cite the filmmaker who had some amazing mythic story. You can say, oh, but that person did this and that person did that. Yes, that's true. And I'm sure, and, and in World War I, of, when, you, when, when they, they, they found in a battlefield two bullets that had hit each other. 
There were a lot of bullets fired in World War One. Yeah. Only two of them hit each other. <laughs> so, so when you're looking at all that, you're like, well, well, well this story proves my point. Um, yeah, it proves your point. It's also one of a trillion stories that don't yeah. prove your point. You, you, without having some basis in understanding how movies are made and why they work, you can't do anything in this business to any level of independence or success. Yeah, totally. So, so, so learn how to do it by doing it. Focus on execution and not result. Focus on learning how to make movies, and you'll find yourself making them. I never set out to be the director of Mission Impossible. I never set out to be the director of four Mission Impossibles or Jack Reacher or the producer of Top Gun. I, the, I found out I was the producer of Top Gun at the first test screening when my credit appeared on screen. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I turned to Tom Cruise and he was like, yeah, you know, I mean, I didn't, if that's that to me, that's how my career has manifested itself. I did hard work with the right people and, uh, and, and failed as much as I succeeded. So it, that's all a very long way of saying, get out there and fail. If you want to succeed, get out there and fail. Chris, like I said, you are literally Rocky. I mean, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to me, sir. I mean, let me just, I'll say this on there. I don't care if you look like a jackass. Chris has genuinely been one of the kindest directors I've had the absolute honor of interacting with. Like I said, I messaged him. I didn't have any directors interviewed. And for some reason, he replied to me and said, yeah. And that really gave me the confidence to keep up interviewing directors. So it's all built up to this. So, Chris, I'd just like to say on record, thank you so much for chatting me, sir. Before I let you go, are you on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, anything like that? Am I what? Sorry. On, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, anywhere people can follow you. I, am, uh, I have a I have a suspended Instagram account. I may I may re, I may reanimate someday. And I'm on uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I I read it often and respond occasionally uh when when people ask me questions i like to i like to retweet the question with an answer that i think will be helpful to uh to filmmakers you know writers and, and directors um one really important note for anybody who's listening i can't retweet your question if it contains a compliment there's nothing grosser <laughs> hey i think your movies are awesome here's the question i was like i don't because uh, to me it's that gets into a territory that's so oogie so a lot of times when i'm not responding to people it's because i'm not i'm not i'm not amplifying their their very very generous compliments but if anybody listening has a question for me on on twitter that's related to film uh i'm happy to answer it uh i I, I, I'm not interested in telling you my favorite anything. I'll always answer the same way. My opinion is meaningless. Uh, but anything that where I can where I can tell you how I did something, where I can yeah. answer a question honestly and factually, I'll 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 answer it when I can. Oh, amazing! Uh, anything you can promote, or is there a release? There's no release date for Dead Reckoning, is there? Uh, Dead Reckoning is coming out July of 23, and Dead Reckoning Part Two is coming out in June of 24 uh the movies are um i think i can say this they're they're off the chain they're they are they take everything we have they done and go beyond and i and and the and anything that you see in seven uh to part one it's 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 answered in part two with something so extraordinary you're you're tom cruise is has leveled up on Tom Cruise and it's, oh, man. it's really 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 extraordinary what he has done in these in these two movies I mean, and what's it's... coming up what we haven't shot yet scares me to my very core the dude you paint an amazing picture and everyone I just everyone go check out Chris's work before we finish up you can follow me over on Twitter if you'd like I'm at Sambo Gizmo one or just type in Daniel Fee 33 and you'll find me there and um, as always, if you have the means, please make sure to donate to the National Deaf Children's Society. Uh, as always, that'll be the first link up there. But yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. And also, let me allow me to shout out Declan Shelby. His newest comic, Old Dog, comes out September 28th. We were literally talking to him about, I was. I told him I was going to interview Chris McCory soon. And he was like, yeah, no, you're not. No, you're not. And I was like, I am, I am. We're best friends. Uh, but this comic, if you're a fan of Chris's Mission Impossible, you love Old Dog. It's a lot of ties to it. And he even it said it's Mission Impossible meets uh, someone else. But yeah, go check out Old Dog. And uh, also, apologize. Guys, apologies to Colm Griffin. I moved his art down. I'll be putting up the Superman print soon. But yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. And Chris, 
if I ever get to be a filmmaker, I hope I get to be half as generous as you are, sir. I cannot, I can only apologize for taking up so much of your time. But yeah, thank you so much, sir. It's been an absolute you genuine. Know, I'm honor. so I'm so glad you wrote to me. And I I just had a very strong feeling when I when I read your email. I that just that that this was going to be something special and I was not disappointed. I'm I, I love what you do. You All legend. Right. This is my best friend, McHugh. I can call him McHugh because we are best friends. Our new sheep project comes out soon. Like it's 800 pages, but listen. Now, thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you all in the next video. This has been my interview with the man, the myth, the legend, McHugh.